So in our final video, we're going to be going, going over face milling the rest of this material off, right? Because all of our all of our features have been machined, and all we got to do is face this off. So just for the sake of demonstration, I'm going to show you how to save stock as an STL file and load it into a new group. You don't have to do this for something simple like this. I wouldn't. I would normally just write a facing toolpath separate from these toolpaths and run that um, run that on the machine as a separate program. Now, again, for the sake of demonstration and conciseness and clarity, I want to show you how to do it. So we'll go ahead and verify all of our selected part program files there. Toolpath, sorry. Just simply play it through until it's done. We know it's correct, so we don't have to worry about the position here. Alrighty, so in my Verify tab here at the end, I can choose to save this stock as an STL, so we'll go ahead and click that. Sometimes it can take a moment or two to load, and I'll go ahead and save this to my desktop again, just because I'm lazy right now. And I'll rename this to Second Up Stock. And I'll save that. It might take a minute or two to save that. Especially with larger files, it'll take quite a bit of time sometimes to save all of that, um, all of that geometry as an STL. So we're all good there. Back into our master cam window here. <clears throat> There's a couple ways I can do this. Again, I can just make another toolpath or add a group. So if I had multiple toolpath groups, pretty easy. I'll go ahead and create another toolpath group. To do that, you have to make sure you're on machine group. Click that, right click there, go into groups, and now you can click a new toolpath group. And that's just within the same machine group here. It's going to allow you to create, to divide your, your operations. If you have, you know, more than 10 or 20, you can label these with drilling operations or different, you know, subcategories. Here we'll go ahead and actually create a new machine group altogether. So new machine group. And with bigger files, oops, that didn't do it. New machine group. And I want to choose a mill group. Okay, so that brings up a whole new section where I can choose to input a new stock. Okay, so I'll come back to that in a sec. But I might want to label this click it, press F2, oopsies, and change the name to second up. All right. So first thing I want to do when I'm setting up a new operation like this is I don't want to actually transform this or move it around anywhere because that's going to screw up all of these tool paths. Okay. We don't want to do that. I'll go ahead and collapse those for the sake of viewing it easier. So what I actually want to do is create a whole new work plane. So I'll grab this gnomon at the bottom, click it, and again I can bring this to wherever I want it. I like to do it in the center again, so auto cursor here, midpoint of two points. Choose my first midpoint to my second midpoint, and now I have my gnomon where I want it. But my Z is completely upside down, so let's grab the X here and we'll type in 180, and then I'll flip it up, okay? So we'll name our plane, and this X direction doesn't really matter, and I mean, technically it's gonna flip around like that, but because it's just a simple facing operation, it doesn't matter. However, if you were actually doing a second operation with features on both sides, you would wanna make sure that your, op, um, your X axis and your Y axis are facing the correct orientation, by changing this here. Again, to rotate, you're always choosing the center of those arcs. So we'll name our plane second up facing. All right, go ahead and click OK there. Now you see it went back into the other original plane, okay, because we didn't change it yet to be active. So let's go into our planes manager and you can see the work coordinate system, the construction plane and the tool plane are all still on the top and it's the active plane. 
to change our other plane to be the active plane, let's go ahead and click equals, and that's going to, you can see, set current, blah, 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 to your selected plane. And now you can see our grid has moved, and we've got a new set of these coordinate system lines here. So you've got the master top right here, and then you've got an auxiliary set right here, and this is where it can get a little cluttered. So I might turn those off in my view selection here, show axes, I can turn off specific ones. In this case, I'll just turn them all off. Okay, so we're all set up with our new plane, top right in the center where we want it. Let's go into our stock setup now and see what we're working with. So we'll go into stock, and in this instance, we're going to want to select file. And we'll choose the file right here from wherever you saved it, in this case, my desktop. You see the STL file right there, and it only allows you to use STL files. And I'll open that. Now I've got to turn on my display, and I don't want wireframe. I'll show you why. This kind of looks just really annoying. So in our stock setup, let's choose the solid setup here. And that's a little easier to see. So you can see, now we've got or stock there, that translucent red is all the stock that hasn't been cut yet. Okay, so pretty handy little uh, tool there. If you need to move this stock around, the only way to move it is to change its plane. So if I choose the front plane, it's going to move it into the front plane. So you got to keep that in mind based on how you've set it up. So you usually are going to want everything from that home position going downward. You're going to have to sort of guess around and play with it until you learn how to do it properly. So there's our stock. And now all we've got to do is create a facing operation and a chamfer operation to make everything all nice. So we'll go into tool paths quickly, face, and I can actually leave this as is. I don't really have to do anything because they're stock, but I'll go ahead and choose the, the edges anyways. So we'll go ahead and use two inch face mill. You can see new machine group, there are no tools. So we'll go ahead and grab a two inch face mill again. We've got one right there. And for my comment, I'll put face to height. And here, you can see we've got a, about a quarter inch of material there. You can't really take, I mean, you can take that with certain face mills, but we don't really want to. It's pretty hard on the machine and the cutter. So we'll do, cut parameters are all good. We got to change this again to zigzag. And now one thing I didn't show in the previous, uh, where am I at? Sorry. In the previous facing operation is roll cutter around corners. So sharp means that it's going to come out here to a point, go down and come back over, right? In a sort of a square shape. Rolling around corners is all. If we do that, it's going to roll around those corners. And also, when you're going around the corner, you want to do what's called high speed loops. And that way, it creates those radii there. And we don't want to leave any stock on the floor again. We're not using another tool to finish, so let's make sure that's set to zero. And for our depth cuts, again, we want to use depth cuts. So we'll choose depth cuts on. And 50 thousandths is fine for depth cut. And let's actually turn on a finish pass, just a light finishing cut and our finishing cut depth. We can use as ten thousandths of an inch. All right, you can keep the tool down on a facing operation. That's going to prevent it from retracting and moving back to its start point. I sometimes use that, but it's kind of dangerous sometimes, so usually we'll keep it off. Linking parameters. So we're going to finish at zero, and our top of stock is actually positive 0.25 because we've got quarter inch above the top of the part that we want to cut. We'll actually set that to absolute zero. 
OK. So you can see we've got a number of passes going on here. One pass, two pass, three pass, four pass, and then you can see at the bottom that very small 10,000th finish pass. So the great thing about having an STL file as your stock is you don't have to deal with having to run all your operations in, in the simulator because you've already got them cut. You don't have to worry about running old stuff, so it's a good way to, to keep current on what you've already done with your part. So we'll play through and see what we have here. Okay, so we can see we've cut our stock to the final height of the part. All we have to do now is simply put in a quick chamfer. So, contour, really quick with this. Make sure our cutting direction is right and it is going the wrong direction. So let's reverse. Boom. Okay, we'll use a chamfer mill, half inch chamfer mill. It's already pulled up for me, how convenient. Comment that chamfer the outside. And our cut parameters, 2D chamfer, same as before, 20 thousandths, 50 thousandths offset. And make sure we're at absolute zero. Good. And we can change the top of stock in this case to be zero if we wanted to. And there's our chamfer mill. So we'll go ahead and again, not that we really have to, but make sure that we have our toolpath operating correctly. Got the color loop on. All right, so we've got our part completed. This part is ready to go. The only thing that I would do at this point before I would run this on the machine is I would go in and I would go into my tool settings and I would modify these speed rates and feed rates, you know, but that will save for another lesson. All right, so that's Mastercam programming a simple part, two dimensional part from start to finish, with all the details and all the little tips and tricks. One thing that we won't cover is post-processing, but I'll go ahead and I'll just show you what that looks like, all right? So if I choose all of my tool paths from the first group here, and I click this G1 button, post-selected operations, that's where we're filtering it, basically. So right now it's using MP Finuc post, that's just the standard default. You can either ask or overwrite. I'll overwrite it, and I'll go ahead and post it. So what this is going to do is going to actually output the G code that's going to be used for the CNC to interpret the movements. In your home learning edition of Mastercam, you're not actually able to post code because it is the free version and they don't want you making parts. So you'll have to use that on a Mastercam seat at the university if you were interested in actually posting your stuff. I have the ability to post student files from my computer as well. So when you get, this is your actual G code here, this is the, the file that's going to be used to run the part on the machine. You've got a tool list here, you've got your part file location, and the actual file location for the NC code, the numerical control code, okay? And your part number here, 0000. zero, zero, zero. So all of these commands here are basically just commands. They're simple. So T322 stands for tool 322. M6 stands for a tool change. So all that's saying is, K okay, call up tool number 322 into the spindle. G0s are rapid moves, so get from point A to point B as quickly as possible, usually from non-cutting zones to getting ready to cut. So you want to move between those as quickly as possible. And then this here is just your position of that first cut. All right, so then from here, you've got actual movement. So G1 is going to be your feeding motion, and that's your feed rate. That's inches per minute. So this is feeding at 1.07 inches of linear travel per minute of time. And you can see what's good about 
writing all those comments in is that it actually outputs those comments before the operation, right? So this to here is all your facing stuff, okay? So that way you can kind of see where all of your stuff is at, which is really convenient, especially if you're looking through a file like this, you can kind of see what you're looking for. So finish the outside, right? And then rough the main pocket. So these pocketing operations are going to be quite extensively long. You know, you can see all that motion command there. So that's a quick overview of G-code, and in later videos we'll get you know more into that. But as you can see, a simple part file like this, 7,000 lines of code, 7,347 lines of code actually. There are some tips and tricks you can do, especially for the roughing of the pockets that you can use to reduce the code size, but nevertheless, with those more advanced OptiRough toolpaths, you're going to be ending up with a lot, a lot of code, which isn't necessarily a bad thing because modern CNC controllers are able to interpret that. And one thing I didn't mention about these high-speed toolpaths is that their feed rates can run extremely fast, whereas I might cut this toolpath this pocketing operation on a standard toolpath, like a pocket op, I might be running this with 3 8 end mill at 15 to 30 inches per minute of linear travel speed. With this high speed toolpath, I might be pushing that cutter at a feed rate of 175 inches per minute. So you're really pushing the limits of how fast you can cut with those. So the, the cut time on using these toolpaths is generally going to be a lot faster. So that's all for now. Go ahead and save your part if you want. And in the next series, we're going to be covering a little more intermediate part. Same kind of concepts, just a little more complicated.